Grow, Sell, and Retire is the podcast for the lazy overachiever. B.D. Dalton, author of The Assisted Purchase, True Gravity, and Grow, Sell, and Retire is here to give his 25 years of secrets, tips, and assistance to take your business to the next level. This podcast is for anyone who wants to sell more, work less, and make better business. Now, here's your host, BD, with today's GSR podcast. Hey, everybody, BD Dalton here in the Growth, Sell, and Retire podcast, talking about secrets for the lazy overachiever. And today I'm here with Wayne Mullins. Um, Wayne, where are we talking from? So I'm in the UK. Where are you based? I'm in the wonderful city of Alexandria, Louisiana. Louisiana. It's there for the, your whole life or just moved there or what? what's happened? Yeah, I haven't made it far. I was actually, the hospital I was born at is literally about three blocks down the street from my office. Very cool. So Birmingham, Alabama is how far away from Louisiana? Because of Birmingham, UK, everybody always asks me since I'm American, Birmingham, <laughs> Birmingham, Alabama. So how far away is that from, from you? Probably hours around away. eight hours, seven to eight hours, I believe. Not too bad. That's top to bottom of the whole UK. So that's that's, <laughs> that's pretty good. Okay. So tell tell us about your business, how how you got there and also how you came up with the name. So walk us through the whole thing right there and then we'll go into some great questions. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my background, I have a degree uh, in marketing and business with specialization in marketing. Um, but upon graduation, decided that I really wanted to hone my ability to sell. So I went into the sales profession and I spent three years there learning how to sell. That then opened up a lot of doors for me um, and enabled me to actually then start businesses for myself. So I started a company, grew that company over the course of three years and sold it. And as a result of that particular journey, a lot of other entrepreneurs started coming to me, asking me for advice just around the idea of how did you grow? How did you scale so quickly? And the answer was marketing. We did some very unique, very different things. Um, so those conversations just naturally kind of turned into the idea of what if I did this for for my new role, for my new, new job and Ugly Mug Marketing was born. And the name comes from a gentleman you're probably familiar with, at least his name, David Ogilvy. Um, David Ogilvy, the founder of Ogilvy and Mather. Um, at one point, the largest ad agency in the world, they're still in the top 10. But David had a quote inside of his offices that was, I would rather you show me an ad that's ugly and effective over one that's beautiful, but isn't. And so the name Ugly Mug Marketing is really just, you know, in many ways, it's our North Star. It is this whole notion and whole idea that we don't want to be distracted by awards. We want to stay focused on what matters most to our clients. And that is results. ROI, sales, all that fun stuff that we all root back to and, and the, the bank account getting full. So yeah. there's, you talked about that. So how do you, in, in a lot of people, because you're in a creative area, how do you create this, you talk about high performance culture. So how do, how do we build that into the creative sector, into other, other places that typically don't want to talk about sales, but everybody wants to talk about profits and having jobs, but nobody wants to talk about sales. So how do you build that high culture, or kind of high performance culture? Yeah, I would say that, you know, number one, it's a mindset. So I live in an entrepreneurial world. I talk to business owners all the time. I've been a part of really high level mastermind groups of other entrepreneurs. And one of the most common things that I see over and over again is this mindset that employees, team members are nothing more than a necessary evil to some other end, right? Whether that's to living their dream the way they want, to having freedom, to having more money. And I'm speaking in terms of the business owner, the entrepreneur. And although none of them are going to come out and say that blatantly, it comes up in the other things that they say. So they're always complaining about their team members. They can't trust their team members. No one wants to work anymore. You know, there's this long list of reasons that people are giving. And I came to the realization several years ago that, look, if I'm going to do this thing, if I'm going to continue growing this business, I don't want to be like all those other entrepreneurs who are constantly complaining about their team. And so for me, it started with the mindset shift that was, I can create a culture that is both high performance and self-accountable. And there's a lot of nuanced things 
that have been done that I've been very intentional about to do that. Number one's mindset. Number two is the understanding that culture comes from the same Latin word as cultivate. So when we think of cultivate, we think of farming, we think of the soil. And what that should communicate to people is that culture is something that is ongoing. It's not something that you set and forget, right? It requires continuous work and continuous effort to build the culture that you actually want. So when you're building a culture, so when you started off, so or if you were starting again, so let's say you you now sell Ugly Mug and you move on to the next one. How do you get people to understand a culture besides leading and doing it from your own thing? How do you get the people around you to drink the Kool-Aid to make it go forward? Sure, there's, there's two opposing forces when it comes to culture. Number one is alignment and the other one is autonomy. So alignment and autonomy are kind of working you know, in opposites, they're pulling against each other. And so what we often see in organizations is they vacillate back and forth between these two things. Now, by default, we are wired in certain ways that we are either very, um, what I would call a micromanager. In other words, we demand high alignment. We micromanage every little piece, every little component. The other side is we are more hands-off we allow people to just go do things and then we get frustrated because they didn't do the things that we wanted or hoped they would do. And so in order to build that culture, what I would number one do is make sure that we are aligned around the right things. And as cliche as these, all, these things sound, I, I had to learn this the hard way myself, having a clear vision, having a clearly defined mission, having values, and then having clear expectations, not just for the organization as a whole, but clear expectations for each specific role within the organization. Once those things are in place and once they are agreed upon, so in other words, just because we have those things in place and just because we sit down and walk a new team member through those things doesn't necessarily mean that they're buying into them yet. We have to come to an agreement on why they're there why they should be followed, et cetera. And until that takes place, we cannot turn people free and loose just to go do what they want. And so that is where I would start. As cliche as it sounds and as many other things that we should be focused on in those early days, mission, vision, values is so, so critical and expectations. So how do you get... So now now you go back into your current business and you've kind of started off and it kind of ran faster than you you thought it was going to. And to reprogram that culture or reset to the culture button, how does somebody that's listening to this say, we've been going for 15 years, 10 years, we're successful, quote unquote, because the owner's driving the right car and all that type of stuff. How do we get the team now to say, oh, this isn't just a let's create a mission statement exercise so that we all feel good again. How do we, how would you look at helping somebody reset? Yeah. Number one, I would say um, it starts with an apology. So as the leader, as the founder, you must take full responsibility. You must apologize to your team and say, look, I've allowed our culture to slip in this direction. I've allowed us to become complacent in all these ways. And it starts with me. It starts with the exceptions and the excuses that I make as the owner, as the founder, as the entrepreneur. And from this day forward, I need you, my team, to hold me accountable to these ideals and to these vision, this value, these values that we have in place. And it's going to be mutual, though. I'm going to hold you to those standards. We oftentimes, as entrepreneurs, give ourselves a pass. In other words, we expect more from the other people than we do from ourselves. In other words, when we take a two-hour lunch break, it's okay because, quote unquote, it's our business. We founded the business. But when someone else on our team does that, we get mad, we get upset, we get livid. And so it starts with those types of conversations, the apology. It starts with getting crystal clear about what are the expectations that we are agreeing to live up to. Not default, because we're always going to default to the easier path. We're always going to default to the path of least resistance. But what are the expectations that we're going to live up to that are going to make us great as an organization? Those are awesome. And I think that's very difficult for some people to do, to admit that they let things go because things were too easy or we were just firefighting. So that that really takes us to, to that whole new level. So Talking a little bit about that, how do you then start to 
bring people through an organization, not just the culture bit, but then how do you start to bring leaders to mirror what you're doing so you can move on? So mirror leadership or however you would phrase it. Yeah. So the very first thing I would say is that as entrepreneurs, we love to be the hero, right? And that's a wonderful thing. That's part of what enables us to jump out to try to solve problems, to risk so much, you know, walk away from corporate jobs, whatever it may be, because we love to help other people solve problems. But if we aren't careful, that very thing, that very desire that serves us so well in the early days will become our downfall. It will become a detriment to our future success. And so for me, what I had to learn to do is I had to learn to stop being the hero. And one of the most important things that I did was I took a sticky note and I wrote it and I put it on my computer screen. And it simply said this, it said, ask, don't answer, ask, don't answer. So anytime a team member would come to me with a question or a problem or a challenge, our default response is, oh, go do X, Y, and Z, and the problem's gonna be taken care of. We know the answers, right? Because it's our baby. It's the thing that we're passionate about. And what we do when we just fire off an answer like that is we train them to come to us because we are the answering machine. And so I had to condition myself. I had to train myself to stop just giving answers to their questions and instead ask them questions. So in other words, they come to me with a problem and they say, hey, we've got this situation with a particular client. What should I do? I had to learn to ask, well, what do you think we should do in this situation? And then they would give an answer and I would say, why do you think we should do that? And then they would give that answer and I would say, well, What would happen if X, Y, or Z? So again, I'm training them on how to think like an owner, how to think like a leader. And when we look around at our team, if we look around and we say, you know, there's no leaders here, there's no one willing to step up. It's not their fault. It's our fault because we train them to behave that way. So again, it it starts with us. What's the the favorite question or that the you've ever been asked by by a client? So if, if they get good at this and you teach them and you say, well, how, how do you think the client's going to feel? What is the best question that somebody's come back to you when you said, oh, the Jedi Yoda has now become Luke and Luke has now become Yoda? So who's done that for you or what's the question? Yeah, there's there are so many questions, but here's the, here's, I'm going to skirt around your question by saying this. What's so interesting about that is used to my days were filled with answering all these various questions, right? From we have four different departments in our company. So, you know, at any point in time right now, we're dealing with somewhere between 130 and 150 clients um, scattered all across the country. And so by default, that is a lot of potential questions. But what's interesting as I've trained my team, to think for themselves, right? Which they're all capable of. Everyone listening to this, everyone on your team is capable of thinking for themselves if you're willing to invest in them, if you're willing to train them. I don't get that many questions anymore because they know how to think through them. They know how to solve them. And then one other note that I will say is so, so important is when you begin going down this road and you begin empowering your people to think and to make decisions on their own, they are going to make mistakes. They are going to make decisions that you would not have made. So a client problem arises, you would have handled it this way. They chose to handle it a different way. In those situations, your job is not to correct them and tell them you did it wrong. You should have done it this way. Your job is to probe and to ask questions to help them understand that there may have been a different way to solve that problem. So again, there's going to be mistakes. We have to be willing to tolerate those mistakes, tolerate people making decisions differently than we would. Awesome. So when you're when you're going through that process, now let's kind of dip into what you actually guys really do for your 130 clients because this is what got you back into Ugly Mug. Is So what are you seeing right now that people are not doing effectively in their marketing. I know there's a lot of them, but let's, if if we were starting up and we're resuscitating what we were doing because we're moving into an interesting time. UK just came out with numbers that say recession's coming. A lot of my friends are saying recession's coming, whether it's a slow recession, a short recession, a shallow one, whatever it is, things are going to change and we need to elevate our game. What does marketing need to feel like or look like 
in, in your opinion, that people aren't doing? I'm going to give you two different answers to that. Um, they're, you know, they overlap. They're very similar. Number one is I see still today that the temptation is to not do strategic marketing. The temptation is stronger today to do just tactical things, right? To chase the new platform, to follow the latest and greatest guru's advice. And that robs us of the ability to think strategically and to piece everything together right? To complete the puzzle, to build out what we're trying to build. You know, a simple analogy of that is, you know, you can take a box of Legos, you can get a box of Legos that you buy from a store. And without seeing that end picture, without seeing that end result that you're trying to create, you can build a lot of wonderful things. Like you could build a car, you could build a house, you could build a this. But if on the box, you're supposed to be building a boat, you're doing it wrong, right? And so, I think that so often we're so busy piecing together Legos, piecing together all these various marketing things that we build the wrong thing. And then we complain that the Legos didn't work, right? The individual pieces didn't work because we didn't end up with the boat. We have to step back sometimes and think strategically, which requires a lot of time, a lot of intention, and a lot of effort. Because the most difficult work that we can do as marketers is not creating the campaigns. The most difficult work is learning to think strategically. So when and, and how, when you, when you look at your own business and what you've done, um, how do you measure success for yourself overall as an entrepreneur, or as a person and an entrepreneur? Sure, I'm an incrementalist. So I used to have these grand visions of, you know, success and entrepreneurship and what all that meant. And what I've learned over the years is I've had to detach myself from what I would often call the kind of this Americanized, you know, grand vision of what an entrepreneur should be or could be. And I really have learned to love and embrace this idea of getting a little bit better incrementally better every single day. And so my mission is to push that into the organization because if we get just a fraction better every single day, we all know the compound effect and what that does. But again, so often in entrepreneurship and in business, we get impatient. We jump from thing to thing to thing. We're trying to create these big jumps, right? We're trying to go from, you know, zero to a hundred really quickly. And in doing that, we sabotage ourselves. Instead of doing these incremental things that we know are going to produce over time, we are always looking for that next magic thing. So that is that is what I'd say for us, what, what we're focused on. That's very good. And who would you say is somebody you, you follow or a mentor or something else? And what's kind of the nuggets that you've taken from them? Because you've given us lots of things. So we, we all learn from somebody and gather information from people. Who are some one or two or three that you've really gathered? And what are the, the main points that you've taken away from them? Yeah, I'm going to give an overarching and then come backwards into that. Perfect. So, one of the most difficult lessons I've had to learn over the years is this, that good advice applied at the wrong time is bad advice. Good advice applied at the wrong time is bad advice. So for years in the early days of my business, I would look around, I would seek out mentors, I would seek out gurus, if you will, in areas that I wanted to get to. And I would attempt to apply the strategies and the things that they were teaching to where we were. The problem was the strategies, the things that they were teaching, the people that I was seeking out, they were teaching strategies for companies at a completely different level from where we were. So great advice, solid advice, but I was attempting to apply it at the wrong time. And so to answer the question slightly more directly, even though it's still indirect, is this, that over the years, what I've attempted to do is I've attempted to get crystal clear about where we are today and where we want to go in terms of the next phase. So not the end picture, but the very next phase. And then I ask myself, what are the skills? What are the strategies? What are the things that I need to learn to move me from where we are today to where we're going to be you know, in the next 12 months, the next 24 months. Because what that has done for me is it enabled me to stay focused on the things that matter most now based on where I'm going over the next short-term period of time. So 
I, I'm, I'm all about being the, the lazy overachiever. That's all the stuff we talk about. So are there things that you're using right now when it comes to AI, software as a service, anything else that's making your life more efficient or more fun? <laughs> yeah, so more efficient would be this, not a sexy answer. Um, but I'm a huge believer that our daily routines create so much in our lives. So for me, one of the things that makes me so effective and so efficient is I keep virtually the same schedule seven days a week. Now, that doesn't mean I'm working on the weekends, but I wake up at the same time. I go through the same exact morning routine seven days a week. I end my days at the same time. I go through the same evening routines every single night. And so what that does is it creates these capstones on my day right? And by having those capstones, it enables everything else to take place more operationally operationally efficient. Yep. Is it maybe the best way to say that? Um, and so that is, honestly, that is like the ultimate cheat code for me as an entrepreneur. It's keeping the beginning routine and the ending routine the same every single day, seven days a week. And by doing that, so many of my decisions already get made for me because I have those two strong capstones at the beginning and end of my day. And what are some of those those things? Are you a, are you a yoga person? Are you a meditation person? Are you a, so what what are some of the things that you add on to the beginning or affirmations or what what do you use for part of your? You don't have to give us the whole routine, but what are some of the things that they can add in? Yeah, so meditation is a part of that, a, a big part of that. Um, reading is another part of that. Every single morning, um, exercise, moving getting, you know, whether that's running, whether that's lifting weights, something to, you know, stimulate your body, get your body moving, get everything going. Um, that's another huge aspect and huge component for me. But, you know, I would say meditation and reading, feeding my mind with the positive things. The, it's, I would lean towards affirmations, although they may not be directly that thing, but it's definitely in that direction. That's great. Um, and so then... How do you, when you do things like this, how do you become the magnet that, do you continue to do those? And then what do you think about some of your leaders that are coming through that might not follow your same routines or your same ethos or your same thought process, but still believe in what you're trying to do for your clients? How does how does that sit with you? Or how is how do you deal with that conflict of people that are still different, but you are trying to drag them along or bring them along with you on your journey? Yeah, I would say the beautiful thing is this, that when we agree on being incrementalist, when we agree on getting a little bit better every single day, it removes everything else, right? We're focusing on the end that we want. The means doesn't matter to me. So if you're, you know, the way you choose to function, the way you choose to live your life still serves to help you get a little bit better every day. And I'm talking holistically here, right? That's not just about work. It's just not just about clients. It's about your health. It's about your mental health. It's about, you know, your relationships outside of work. It's all of these components. That is the culture that we attempt to foster. And, you know, again, from from my personal experience, the best way to push that into your culture is to live it well for them to watch. That's awesome. So... What type of clients do you typically deal with and how do they how do they engage with you guys? Sure. So we, I mean, we don't have a particular niche or industry that we work with. Um, we love to say that we work with growth-minded entrepreneurs. So growth-minded just simply means you're attempting to grow. You're not happy with just marginal growth. You, you're actually seeking, you know, pretty significant growth. Um, and entrepreneurial meaning you're, you're willing to challenge the status quo. You're willing to do things a little bit different. You're willing to push the envelope a bit. Um, our typical clients typically fall in the 750,000 to, you know, our largest client right now is about a billion a year in revenue. So it's a huge range. Um, we also work with startups who are doing 100,000 a year. Uh, it is a huge range, but we just love pouring ourselves into our clients. Those who even will never be able to work with us. We are always offering free training, free all kinds of resources just to help people because at the end of the day, that's what we're really after. That is really good. You said you you read every day. So what what are some of the, either the books or the sources that you go to to get some of your knowledge, inspiration, and feel good stuff or expand your mind? 
Yeah, I would say, um, you know, so as a reader, what typically happens for me is I'm reading a book, they will reference another book, it then gets added to the cart. Um, you know, a couple of books that come to mind that really, really stand out to me. Number one would be The Mountain Is You by Brianna Weist. Really, really powerful book. And it's all about overcoming self-sabotage. That's the whole thesis of the book. Another one's called The Choice by Dr. Uh, Edith Edgar, I think is the author of that book. Another extremely powerful book has nothing to do with business. Neither one of those books have to do with business. Um, and then I, I do read a lot of, you know, your traditional business books as well. Um, you know, so I, I try to I try to keep it very broad within, you know, kind of personal development, leadership, business growth, marketing spectrum. That's awesome. So kind of one tip looking back, so we call it the rewind segment. So if somebody just catches this right in the last minute and they want to re- rewind and listen back to to what Wayne Mullins is delivering to us, um, what's your your kind of go away or aha or comeback moment? So your your one quote or your one idea that says, gosh, I want to go back and listen to the whole thing. Yeah, I would say that consistency creates miracles, whether that is in our personal lives, whether that is in our business lives, uh, relationships, it doesn't matter. Consistency creates miracles. And all too often what I see happening is we begin making some momentum. We begin, you know, use analogy, pushing the rock up the hill. And then we decide to take a break. And when we take that little short break, whether it's for a day, whether it's for a week, whatever it may be, what we don't realize is that rock has roll back down the hill so far. Now we start back over with our diet or with our morning routine or with our disciplines in business. And now we have to make up all that ground again. And so little incremental steps every single day will drastically outperform those who come in and try to push really hard for a few days up the hill. And then for whatever reason, stop for a few days, a few weeks, whatever it may be. So consistency, does and will create miracles. That's awesome. So I'm going to put it in the show notes, but where can we find out more about you or about dealing with you or working with you and your amazing teams? Sure. So the simplest place uh, to connect with us is our website. That's uglymugmarketing.com. All of our social media profiles, uh, email addresses, phone numbers, all that's right there in one spot. And then for me personally, where I kind of share more of you know, personal related things, not as much marketing specific. Instagram's the best place and I'm at fire yourself. Fire yourself. That's amazing. So Wayne, it's been amazing to have you on the show. It's been lots of fun. And I've, I'm going to have the post-it note on my screen tomorrow that says ask, don't answer. And that will be, and I'm going to put it, I'm going to put it on, on my partner's desk too, and make sure that we've got that, that, let's not be the answer system here and we can fire ourselves. But Wayne from Ugly Mug Marketing, thanks for coming on the Grow, Sell, and Retire podcast. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed our chat. Thanks for joining us on Grow, Sell, and Retire. For more information, tools, or to book one of our team members to work with your team, business, or to speak at your event or conference, visit rockfine.co.uk. If you like the podcast, you'll love one of BD's three books, The Assisted Purchase, True Gravity, and the book the podcast is based on, Grow, Sell, and Retire. If you want to work for the rest of your life, that is your business. If you don't, that is ours.